Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, everybody. So I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. And um, it's harder to get out the door having experienced a plague. So it's really great to be out back out in the world with you. Um, and I want to encourage you to get out by Tuesday and vote. Every vote counts this year. So get out the door one more time by Tuesday and let your voice be heard. So at Max, artists, um, performers, scientists, creative technologists get together and make work. We support this work in our incubator, Max Machina, and then we present it on our Biennial Festival. Uh, works from our last festival in November went on to many places, including Mass Mocha and Boston Museum of Science. Max Machina will open up another round of uh, residency grants starting November 15th, so please check out our website. Uh, and um, tonight is the second of three Max forums, and here we gather artists and scientists and creative technologists to, to parse out the discoveries, questions, and challenges that inspire their work. And um, tonight we have two guests who are working on different projects for Max, but both are centered on sound and music. And here they will take you on a listening journey from deep time into the near future. So I, uh, we welcome evolutionary biologist David Haskell and composer Paula Matheson. David's most recent book, Sounds Wild and Broken, chronicles the evolution of sound from the first cricket who figured out they could scratch its wings and send sound through the air to the first making of music uh, with bone flutes and caves to concert halls filled with wooden musician, wooden instruments uh, harvested from our forests that filled out spaces with resonant sounds to our computers whose sound delivery is the air pod into your inner ear. So we go from the macro to the micro in terms actually in our, in our delivery of sound. Um, and um, Paula's uh, practice, she, she uh, welcome composer, and she's an acoustic and electric acoustic composer whose work begins on the computer and, uh, and a range of technologies, goes through the concerts hall and back to the aqueduct and caves to reclaim that connection to space and place. Um, the story of sound is the story of our connection to and our disconnection from our environment. Um, so I'm, you know, welcome these, these wonderful thinkers to come share their experience of sound with us. And to guide us through this evening, we are lucky to have Dakota Gearhart. She's an artist, animator, and educator. Her most recent piece is an animated video project, Life Touching Life. She invites scientists, researchers, and caretakers to share their observations on consciousness and its relationship to biodiversity. In this series, Gerhardt performs as a half woman, half algae creature, and might introduce you to a uh, pixel bacteria. So we may come back to a max form and talk about that one day. So I want to thank them all for being here, and I want to thank our partners, New Inc. and Onyx, and special thanks to curator and colleague, Ling Ling Yang, and to Science Sandbox for supporting our Max Machina programming. And um, join us for the third forum, November 16th, with another group of creative storytellers and a cognitive scientist. And I want to invite to the stage now, uh, Dakota, David, and Paula. And I want to invite you all to a reception afterward with a little food and some drink and some more conversation. There will be a QR code at the bar where you can donate to Max to support the work. And um, I enjoy you a, a, an evening of listening. Thank you for coming. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ecologies of Sound. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, before we begin, this is a collaborative event, and I just want to thank and express my gratitude to Max, Kay, Lingling, Ryan, Miriam. Thank you for organizing this. 
Uh, thank you, Newink, Salome, Raul, Maddie, and Andrea. Thank you, uh, Onyx. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you, dear audience, for making the trek to the skyscraper in Midtown. Uh, but especially, thank you, Paula, and thank you, David, for sharing your work and ideas with us tonight. And I'm very excited to be speaking with you both. Yeah, OK. So I'm going to read an intro. I'm going to read it off my phone. So here we go. Last night, as I was in bed and falling asleep, I was thinking about this event and trying to synthesize all the conversations I've had with Paula and David in my imagination. I heard my heart beating against my chest. The sound of its beat was like underwater drumming and felt like ancient life pounding its nerves inside me. Outside my window in Queens, New York, a series of contemporary sounds punctuated the night. The blasting rip of oil combustion from a group of cruising motorbikes shot through the fall air. Right below me, a person speaks into their phone, saying private words meant for someone special. But the words were made public by the proximity of my window. And then, in my own home, a dashing mosquito courageously buzzes past my ear, its tiny wings producing a high-frequency sound that feels just as loud as the motorbikes. Perhaps its desire for my blood amplified my awareness of its presence. As I laid there, all these sounds permeated my mind and body, and I wondered where my inside began and where the outside started. I suppose we are the space in the middle where we are able to join everything around us through the act of listening. In this sense, I am connected to the mosquito, the phone conversation, the motorbike thrill seekers, and of course, my own heartbeat, all from inside a 100-year-old bedroom using this 10,000-year-old perception vessel, which I call my body. Using language and writing, David articulates sonic journeys through modes of embodiment and the hidden connections it can reveal. He speaks about how all music is an embodied ecological experience. In his book, Sounds Wild and Broken, he goes further to suggest all sound is an embodied ecological experience that intimately connects us even across species. He writes how sound connects us all as individuals, but also collectively to Earth and its evolution, even through miles of tangible and intangible distance. In this way, he evokes the sonic impressions of deep time, bringing us closer to sounds from our ancestors, both human and more than human. He generously and creatively reminds us we are part of a soundscape and we shape it whether we know it or not. Ultimately, I believe David gives people an experience that the curious long for, a connection with who we are on planet Earth and why we are here. Using musical composition, Paula travels through the human psyche and enlivens its capacity to have agency during the process of listening. Paula gives us a chance as listeners to be at once in an emotional space, a technical space, and perhaps the most apparent to me, a space that transcends time. Many of her compositions play with the passing of time, both in a micro and a macro sense. She dives into the passing of time from a collective sonic viewpoint, often incorporating her interpretations of amalgamated memory using acoustic and electroacoustic techniques, as well as collaboration with people and non-human beings, like birds and aqueducts, she offers a sonic glimpse into the soul of what our human bias casually writes off as unknowable. Tonight, we will listen with presence and wonder as we play sounds and discuss the many themes that run both through that run through both of these magnificent creative creatives practice. 
two beings making the imagined possibilities of listening real with their words and their work. All right. Okay, so we're gonna start with a few sounds. Uh, we thought we'd take you on a journey and we're gonna start at the beginning with childhood. So if you don't mind, if we can hear the first sound clip of the night and the guiding, oops, the guiding question here is, can you tell us a story of how you became such good listeners or perhaps a sound that made an impression on you as a child? Okay, let's hear the sound. So the sound we heard is a, a Eurasian blackbird uh, singing in, in a park in Paris. And I grew up in Paris in an apartment. And this is a, a sound that made a, a deep impression on me, but I wasn't aware of it at the time. Uh, I in <clears throat> wasn't until much later in adulthood that I that I'd, I'd moved away from Paris, I'd moved to the US, and then I came back and I heard this, this sound, and not only the sound of the bird, but how the sound was resonating around and reflecting off of the buildings around it and mixing with the urban sounds. And I heard that and I was taken right back to when I was three years old, to, to a memory that I didn't even realize that I had. And then I called up my, my parents and that's my mother said, well, absolutely. Every spring in the, in the little apartment block, but in the, the courtyard of the apartment block behind our apartment, there was a single European blackbird singing, singing its song, and that song would resonate in the, in, in the courtyard. So this is a sound that, that for me, uh, taught me about the depth of acoustic memory, and that each one of us carries within us a sort of a, a, an acoustic compass that orients towards home. And that, now this was a, a, a bird sound mixed with the sounds of cities, but it turns out other sounds like the sounds of uh, the, uh, the Parisian uh, equivalent of the, the New York Fire Department going past, uh, even the distinctive sound of the trash trucks uh, going down the street in Paris will, will carry me back to those times. So, so I think we all have those memories within us. And in terms of, of developing that capacity to listen, the th one of the things that has been most important to me is my work as a teacher when I take students outside and invite them into a process of listening, it, it forces me to listen. And, and perhaps later on we could talk about some of the ways that that listening has unfolded. Uh, but, but that sound, uh, the, the, the blackbird sound for me is, a, is, a trans, is, is, is like falling into a little portal of time. Thank you. Um, Paula, can we hear your sound clips from childhood? Uh, 
know, I have to play the whole thing to get that. It's a <laughs> that is the air conditioning unit that um, was outside my um, childhood bedroom, basically. And um, I still love it, actually, because, like, it's one of those things where, like, I'm from Arizona, so, like, I remember distinctly in our pre-air conditioning days to then our air conditioning days where even just the sound of, like, you know, then, like, then you kind of have this constant drone there. And... I, it was the soundtrack of like going to sleep. It was the soundtrack of like, you know, um, those things that so often are heard as distractions, right? Like, but if you pay attention to it, then it turn changes into something else. Um, and so, you know, I've had a lot of really wonderful mentors in my life in terms of like thinking about um, how we, you know, frame our attention in terms of listening. One of those being Pauline Oliveros, who has influenced so many. Um, but she writes so beautifully about like the idea of singing and tuning to refrigerators and things like that. And um, I very frequently find myself unconsciously kind of singing and just tuning uh, with them as well. And so like that particular um, sound for me is an important one in that it just goes like, you know, and then, and so sounds that become notable um, in part because when they leave, when they then stop, the whole atmosphere changes. And so that's something that also really uh, interests me as well. Um, also, there's all the kind of weirdo things of like, there's all these different tones in it, all these sort of things about like inside and outside. Um, and, you know, those technologies change too. Like that's a really old unit. So it has a lot of <laughs> like pretty, uh, pretty great sounds inside of it that probably won't be there uh, forever. Yeah. Great. We have one more for you that we're going to play. So here's another sound from Paula's childhood. So I love the sound, it was like the sound of an orchestra tuning. Um, uh, my mother played in community orchestras and still does, and I got to play in that same orchestra that she played in. And that of course is not the, um, like I love this, where it's not like, it's not the New York Philharmonic, right? Like this is, a, you know, this is the kind of thing where it's like there's a ritual of what we do when we're agreeing to play together, and that has its own sound too. And so all these kind of things, too, about like what the sounds are around certain rituals, whether it's making a cup of coffee or going out, you know, like all these sort of things where we find sound that kind of frame and like let us know where we are um, and then reinforce that. Like, you know, because I love all the sort of things, too, about like, OK, so this per this section plays this A first and that section and that section. And like just kind of hearing that sustain and then hearing people individually uh, sort of like get ready. It's like that anticipation um, uh, is something that that I love and continue to love very, very much. And so I, I love the moment before people start playing, you know, like, because there's just so much beauty in people being accountable to each other like that. Well said. Thank you, both of you. Uh, we're gonna keep cruising and we're gonna move on uh, to instruments. You are both very interested in instruments. David, you often research ancient cultures and, instrument and instrumentation, as well as materials used to make those instruments and our body's connection to musical techniques. I'm hoping you can share some of your research with us. Uh, and so maybe before we can hear a clip. The flute clip? Yeah. So this is a, uh, a sample of sound being played by Anna Friedrika Potinkowski, who's a German uh, flute player. She's playing on a flute made from mammoth ivory uh, that was crafted by Wolf Hein, who is an expert in reconstruction of Paleolithic artifacts. He also works in Germany, has worked with museums all around the world. And the, the reconstruction is one that I commissioned based on the uh, dimensions of the earliest known physical evidence of instrumental music on, on planet Earth, and therefore, of course, in the known universe, 
uh, that uh, from caves in southern Germany, 42,000 year old mammoth ivory flutes and uh, swan and griffin vulture bone flutes. And what we're hearing here is Potenkowski uh, exploring the sonic possibilities within this instrument. That's a very hard instrument to play. I can't evoke anything except sort of a vaguely breathy sound. She tells me she needs to meditate, calm down to, in order to, for, the, for the sound to actually come out in, in a very clean way. And the, the, the tone of the instrument is very much dependent on embouchure, not so much on fingering. There are finger holes on, on, these, on these flutes. And yet embouchure seems to be the main thing that determines how, how sound is, is produced. And these flutes were unearthed from the layers of sediment in, in the caves, which also hold the very first known examples of three-dimensional figurative art anywhere on the planet. Exquisite carvings of, of small human figurines. I'm holding my fingers like this because they're all very small human figurines. Uh, an animals that would have been present there uh, in, in the Ice Age uh, around the, the cave and the, the tundra-like habitat that was present at, at that time. And so th these are people who were living very hard lives, the depth of the Ice Age, long, cold winters. And what did they choose to do with the highest form of their technology, these am amazingly complex stone tools that they had? They made art. They made the first known instru instrumental music and also these, these three-dimensional um, uh, sculptures. Interestingly, there is no known two-dimensional pig pigmented art from, from the cave walls of this time. That may just be because it's degraded through time or that that particular form of art developed in, in other parts of the world. Um, but this, the recording also reminds us that the music is formed, is particularly instrumental music, is chimeric. The, the breath of the hunter, the human hunter, is animating the, the remains of the prey and bringing something, something beautiful uh, something, and something that connects people into the world. And that's, that, we still do that to this day when we play a violin, of course. We're, we're, we're working with, with forests, with spruce and, and maple, uh, Pernambuco in, the, in, in, in violins. Um, but but also, when we're playing electronic music, what are we doing? We're tapping into the ecology that gave us the, uh, the, the electricity. I mean, this microphone is being powered by you know, coal or natural gas or solar or some. We're engaged in ecological relationship, even in those highly sort of mediated technological forms of, of music making. So it's not just the, the ancient Paleolithic bones that remind us and embed us in ecology. It's the most contemporary forms of music. You know, the keyboard um, back home that I like to, to play, plastic keys, where did that plastic come from? Ancient algae buried at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico that were excavated and then are now turned into plastic in my, in my living room. Uh, and so the instruments for me are a way of listening beyond the music into ecology. I mean, of course, being within the music for its own sake, but also imagining that every time we play that keyboard or when an orchestra is tuning up on the stage, we're also hearing a forest come back to life, and, and in particular, human relationships to the forest and to metal ore and to animal skins re-evoked. And, and we, often we hide this, you know, we dress in black on the stage and don't talk so much about the, the, the animals who gave their lives for the skins on the drums. And yet, and, and perhaps we do that for a reason, if we, if we did evoke those spirits, it would be too powerful. I mean, music is moving enough as it is. Uh, so we're, we're very, we have these cultural rituals about being careful around music. And I, you know, I wonder about that. I don't have any particular answers about why that is. But I do think in an age of ecological crisis and diminishment, now is a time to, to reawaken to those relationships and realize that even in places where we imagine ourselves to be separate from the community of life, we're actually deeply, deeply embedded. Wonderful. Can we hear one more sound clip? The violin clip. Thank you. 
so that was a, a, a short clip of a piece by Catherine Lehman playing, uh, and she, she composed a piece and, and played it, uh, on a 19th century violin, playing 19, with a 19th century bow. The piece was written in response to a short essay I wrote about olive oil and the aromas of olive oil. So, so this is a piece about our relationships with trees. Of course, um, olive oil is the foundation of, of most... Uh, cultures and civilizations in the Mediterranean basin and now in, in other parts of the world. And so we, so at least some cultures are deeply embedded and wrapped up with the life of that tree. But in hearing that music, we're also hearing a pre-industrial earth because the Pernambuco wood in the, in, the, in the bow and the maple and the spruce mostly, I mean, what is wood? It's, it's carbon dioxide that trees have welded together into, into cellulose and lignin and captured the breath of that particular moment, that wood grew before we started grow digging oil wells. So we're hearing the pre-industrial earth coming back to life in the resonance, in the movement of, of the wood in relation now to a contemporary player. And so we have multiple centuries converging here, telling a little story about a, a relationship that goes back 8,000 years, and that is humanity's relationship to the to the olive tree thank you uh paula as a composer you have a long and storied relationship with the idea of an instrument let's hear lullaby for dead horse bay and then i would like to ask you what is an instrument to you This track is about three minutes.
beautiful. <laughs> that is the <laughs> amazing Michi Bianco playing that, and she commissioned the piece. Um, she's an extraordinary violinist and composer, and does wonderful work with like electronics and pedals too. Um, but part of what I love about this conversation so much is like this kind of potential and power and unique um, ability. I think sometimes for instruments and music to cut across time in time, right? Like, and so instruments. Like, what is an instrument to me is one of those things. Like, when I talk about this with my students, I always like, go see Toy Story 4, because it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how does a toy become a toy, right? Like, and that kind of question of like, where love and attention and things like that, then like sort of, because like you can really develop a beautiful performance practice around um, like, you know, how to play a balloon, which for example, Judy Dunaway does very, very beautifully. She's a balloon virtuoso. Like, she can play it so extraordinarily, um, and so, um, how you develop that relationship, you get to know the nuance of materials and then you get to share it in time. All these sort of things are um, really things I like to think about. And so like when you see a violin, it has that sort of cultural weight to it in some ways. Um, and then where the electronics for this comes from uh, kind of emerged naturally in terms of conversation. We were talking about um, beaches that have a lot of glass on them mm -hmm. and the way they sound so distinctively. And so this recording is from Dead Horse Bay where uh, there's a lot of historic trash there, and then so it's like kind of a destination for finding really beautiful old historic bottles. And so that kind of magical tr you know, transition where something goes from being waste or you know, trash to being then a desirable object is something that like, interests me as well. Um, but so the sound of water that you hear in that is um, in the beginning is like, <laughs> like sort of stuff. It's the waves receding on that glass, which has such a distinctive sound. Um, and then what I did was uh, took some bottles that were intact relatively from the beach and put small little microphones inside them, a uh, little like hand-built electric condenser microphones. And then using a technique that I learned fr uh, from, from the work of Alvin Lussier, I just simply turned up the volume inside those glasses, which would generate feedback. So then it's like kind of using found materials to make a synthesizer on the beach. So um, it ended up being like, I mean, what I love about that is that then it's not going there with like a tuning system or an idea of a scale or things like that. It's kind of looking with the materials and listening for them and then finding what they offer to you um, by having that sustained contact and amplification in some ways. So, um, so I uh, was able to improvise uh, through that as a way of uh, making that piece. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next question I have for you. You are both inspired by classical instruments, but I'm curious about the role of technological instruments, as you mentioned. I would love to hear how you use and think about the role of technology in your process. Let's start with an iconic piece by David, Ancient Cricket Chorus. <laughs> okay, so this is a speculative <laughs> reconstruction of of what uh, of a two hundred and seventy million year old insect. So this is uh, a, f a fossil insect, of course, no longer with us, uh, called Permostridulus, uh, found from rocks in southern France. And this is the first physical evidence that we have on this planet of any sonic communication device. These are tiny little ridges on the wings of this fossilized insect that look very much like the ridges on the wings of, of modern day crickets and katydids. So, so the assumption is, or the, the, um, the extrapolation is, that the creature was rubbing its wings together and making a little rasping sound. So what I did was measure the, the distance between the little nubs on the ridge on the wing compare those to the distances and the spacing of, of, of the wings of modern crickets, and it turns out that Permostridulus had pretty widely spaced uh, nubs on its, on its ridge, and they were also quite uneven compared to the exquisitely uh, arranged rasping devices on the, uh, the wings of modern crickets and katydids. If you're looking for something uh, other than doom scrolling to do on your, your phone, uh, just uh, Google uh, scanning electron micrograph of cricket wings and you will be blown away by uh, the, the extraordinary beauty of, of these. And so 
using those measurements, I can then reconstruct, and again, I emphasize this is speculative, reconstruct what the sound of this creature might have been like. Of course, I don't know exactly how fast it was moving its wings, how warm the temperature was right then. We do know roughly how big the, the insect was. I used for my model a, a contemporary insect, the, um, uh, the northern mole cricket, that has quite similarly spaced uh, ridges on its nub. So that's, that's a use of technology to, to throw our imagination back in time 270 million years to what these first sounds may have been. The function of the sounds is unknown. Were they to attract mates? Were they startle responses? A lot of insects have this today, where you pick up an insect, it makes a sound, and that causes a predator, a mouse, or a spider to drop the potential prey item, and it can scurry away. So, so the, the ecological function is unknown, but we can specula speculate about the sound. And so technology, of course, is great at inviting the human imagination into other times, also other spaces, of course. That's what field recorders do. You make sound recordings, and then you share them with people, either with some degree of manipulation or not, uh, integrating with human creativity and interpretation as a method of, of sharing. I do worry a little in, in my own work, and also as I share this with students and think about the work of others, that about technology getting too much in the way of embodied, just listening with the apps that come pre-installed in our own bodies, that is the inner ears and the fingertips and the nostrils and the soles of the feet, all those things that uh, Zoom and the modern curriculum of the university and the, the high school and the elementary school generally do a great job of turning us into brains in jars where our senses and our bodies no longer matter. Mm -hmm. And so I think reawakening the senses in, in education and in our own practice is, is really important. And say, talking with other uh, sound explorers and sound artists who, who relate stories about, say, their, uh, some of their colleagues or, or them, themselves in, in younger years making all these great recordings, processing them, producing these amazing pieces, but never having to uh, sat down and just spent a few hours, like an afternoon, just sitting listening to the ecosystem or the city or whatever it is that they are presuming to make sound sonic responses to. So I think the practice of, of directing attention into our ears and just dwelling in the physicality of the sound and seeing where it takes us where it takes our emotions, where it takes our curiosity and intellect, is a, as an important practice. It's not technological. Um, it's an it's an act of the will. It's more of a philosophical move. Yes, well said. Thank you, uh, Paula. In your piece, "The Attraction for Felicious Amplitude," you write, "Of particular interest to me was how small a sonic event." a water drop falling from the ceiling can articulate a much greater space. This smallness is embraced in the string quartet as raw field recordings are transduced through the instruments themselves. Maybe we can listen to this piece and you could tell us more about that. Uh, this piece is about two minutes long.
Can you tell us about what we just heard? Sure. So that's an excerpt um, of Brooklyn Rider playing uh, on the attraction for Felicitous Amplitude. And part of what's fun about that piece is um, when we premiered this, like I, you know, the sort of idea of like smallness implying vastness, because I had the great fortune to work in Rome for a year, like thinking about like ancient aqueduct structures and how do those overlap with like contemporary infrastructure and ancient infrastructure? What is the relationship of a city to its resources and how does that all impact, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of contemporary sounds that our people experience day to day? And there was this one ancient cistern that um, we were able to gain access to. And it was right below this ultra fancy kind of space that uh, where the piece was going to be premiered. And so what I liked was this, like, I, you know, and the story around it was so great, too. Like, they didn't know it was there, right? Like, and then one day the local gardener saw these kids stealing oranges, you know, and then so he, like, chased after them. And then, like, you know, they ducked into this hole. And then, like, the gardener then went and looked in that hole and was like, wow, there's this huge space here, you know? And so... That kind of thing that, like, you know, that's the stuff of, like, dreams and movies, sometimes horror movies, too, but, like, you know, <laughs> the thing of, like, oh, it was there this whole time, but I never knew it, you know? And they, when they compared those, um, the plans for the, you know, kind of what, the, you know, extant structure with that structure underground, like, they didn't overlap, so the new structure was built without knowledge of that being there. Um, and so part of what was like interesting about that was then to go down there and I like had the good fortune because I was working with the American Academy in Rome to just go there day after like I could go in there for hours at a time and listen to how it changed over and over and over and so like it's just felt this impossibility of like implying something so big like these and so it's like okay so water droplet let's focus on that you know and so one day after heavy rains I was able to get these beautiful recordings of water in that space. And then those instruments, like we all went down there together too, the quartet and I did, and then, um, and so they were able to experience that space as well. And then, so what that meant then was like taking those in the same way, like exciting these instruments and the resonances like, across time was like taking those sounds and then using the transducers to then vibrate the instruments with those recordings. And so then the instruments are imparting their own resonances as they're um, acting sort of like as the resonating speaker vessels for uh, those sounds and they sort of take turns um, doing that each with their instruments as they're articulating one line that is shared across the group. And so it was kind of really beautiful to be in that space, uh, sharing that with each other, knowing that this other space was underneath the whole time too, where that came from. Yeah, wow, that's a lot to think about, just thinking about how technology intersects history and architecture um, and sound, of course. Could I add a, a short little reflection on that? So hearing those water drops, I was transported actually back to the Paleolithic caves where these, these flutes were discovered from because one of the most striking things about the cave is water is drops from the ceiling into this enormous space, very reverberant space, creating this, this I mean, the, the reverb goes on for several seconds in there. And, and all of the archaeologists that I talked to uh, who'd, who'd excavated these uh, space, spaces and found the flutes r remarked on this. And so it seems that instrumental music, at least in, in that part of the world, first originated in places with a lot of reverb in them. And so it's interesting that, that then you're bringing that into, a, into taking that reverberation and then bringing it out through much more contemporary uh, instruments of just the last few centuries and then of course it enhanced with uh, mm -hmm. with um, with tech with our contemporary technology yes thank you for adding that which brings us to our next our next question uh, you both have a deep interest in sonic perception of architecture and space your combined interest, or excuse me, your combined research spans forests, fields, caves, aqueducts, ear canals, city architecture, public space, and underwater realms. You both have attuned yourselves to site-specific forms of listening. I'm wondering, let's listen to some of your sound clips about sight, and I'd like to ask you if you could tell us more about how sight impacts your work. So why don't we start with David's clip? So 
So Bird is in the audience, um, of which I'm sure you're all uh, highly attuned. What two species did we just hear? Anyone know? Anyone pull out their Merlin app to, to get it now? If, uh, I, I recommend the Merlin app to you if, you if you're not able to identify those. Our, you know, our ancestors knew all of these bird songs because if they didn't, they could put food on the dinner, on, uh, put dinner on the table. Um, so tuning in, learning to hear and understand a name and then get beyond the name of local species, whether it's birds or the sounds of trees and of wind in pine versus maple. What, what, what are we hearing from, from the, the trees? Anyway, that's a sort of a, a digression. Um, uh, actually, it's not, it's not a digression at all. I think uh, the, it, uh, becoming ecological conver ecologically conversant in the sounds around us is one of the great tasks and the great crises that we face. We, we're in a crisis of inattention and disconnection where most biology majors in the United States now <laughs> cannot name the trees that grow outside the science building on the quad. Uh, and they can't name the 10 most common birds uh, in the environment that they've just spent the last four years. That seems problematic to me, and no wonder we're in an ecological crisis. When our senses and our knowledge is so disconnected after years of, of, of piling information in our, in our brains. So th the two species that we heard and some of the stories behind them, the first one was a summer tanager, very slow, melodic, kind of whistly song. The second was a lark sparrow, very rapid, up and down, whip, 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 whip. So fast you, your ears can't really keep track of it. The first is a bird of dense forest, or at least of, of, of reasonably dense forest. It makes a slow whistled sound because that's the only kind of sound that will work in that environment. A much more rapid sound would get blurred and degraded and the signal would not travel through the dense woods. So across the world, whether you're in Africa, Australia, North America, Western Europe, if you hear that slow, what to human ears sounds, quote, melodic, whistly sound, you know that this is a bird that lives in that kind of dense woodland. The other bird, the lark sparrow, is a, is a bird of short grass prairie, not much vegetation in the way, so it can get away with all kinds of uh, incredible rapid trills and, and so on. So what are we hearing? The sight, the forest or the prairie, has found its way through evolution into the structure of the song. So the forest lives inside the tanager's song. If you're in the mountains listening to mountain birds, you're hearing the song of the mountain through the songs of the birds and the elk and the pikas and the other creatures that, that are there. So, so the relationship between sight and sound is very deep. It goes back tens, hundreds of millions of years and has, that's been one of the great things that, that Sonic, one of the great explanations for why sounds are so different. We live on a planet alive with all sorts of different voices. If, if, if sonic communication was just about, hey, I'm here and I'm very attractive and notice me and so on, just a loud grunt would suffice. <laughs> Instead, we hear incredible variation. I mean, every insect is different. Every fish and shrimp and bird has a different voice. Why is that? It's partly a result of the, of the variegations of habitat that we find around us. There are, there are lots of other reasons and you can, <laughs> there's a great book I can recommend to you that uh, uh, <laughs> describes some of those other causes of the diversification of sound, but sight is one of them. Mm. And that also is a reason why human languages sound different in different parts of the world, one of the reasons. And why music, choral music composed for the great cathedrals of Western Europe sounds different and has a different tempo and pacing and timber than music that you might be pumping out into a, into a very um, padded movie theater now as a movie soundtrack. Space and sound have, have co-evolved back and forth, back and forth, both biologically uh, but also culturally. And part of what we've added, and I'll, I'll mention this very briefly and then, and then be quiet, um, uh, what we've added to that relationship, unfortunately, is injustice and noise. And of course, we live in, in a city that is a prime example of this. Many of the noisiest cities and m most of the noisy highways and bus depots and so on were deliberately placed into minority neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods, directing noise and air pollution to particular people and not to others. And so noise and the relationship between space 
And sound has a, an enormous environmental justice component in certainly in American cities where the federal government had a 90% cost share to subsidize enacting that environmental justice within American cities. And so noise in space is you know, all these wonderful biological examples as well, but there are also some deep fractures and ways in which we've, we've created uh, pain and injustice out of mm -hmm. that by, by breaking that relationship. Thank you for that observation. Um, speaking of cities, why don't we take a listen to Paula's clip, Stations and Resonances. Like one channel is like missing a little bit on that, <laughs> but you can probably these sites are very familiar to <laughs> most to a lot of people here. Um, but like this is um, an amazing composer, uh, performer Matt Welch, who I really wanted to work with on this project. Um, and part of it was the sort of question of like of like noise, space, sight, and like for some of these things that we're talking about too is to sort of approach things um, with kind of seeing what the space suggests, trying to defer to it. Um, and in this case, um, I was working also with Olivia Valentine, a frequent collaborator of mine, as well as Warren Enstrom, to sort of follow the pathway of the original 1904 Interborough Rapper Transit Line, mm. and then sort of to do these like miniature recordings and like use the map as sort of a guide for score, for score. And then so basically it's one line, but because we're recording it at every single stop, so you don't hear the full thing until it's all assembled later, right? <laughs> So like part of it was to like let not filter out the noise that's in there because it's a huge part of that. And so all the cuts are really this like, you know, through a lot of it, really hard cuts to emphasize that the noise profile that is so frequently filtered out actually has a lot of really interesting information in it. And so that like in those sort of very, very kind of severe movements because of the acoustical power of the, of the bagpipes, you kind of hear things still sort of being kind of continuous in terms of the musical line, but the like profile of what's in the background is the thing that um, has its own separate counterpoint to that by working this way. So you, that was that was a composition based on the, a subway line map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So like you, know, so part of what you know the original like subway design right like was like you can still see parts of it. Uh, which are um, like really old, beautiful molding because it was like luxury. That's how it was initially marketed. And like, I think probably maybe some people, I, you're not really allowed to do this, but you can book tours for it, right? Like, which is to stay on the sixth line till it turns around. And then you get to see like the, what was the jewel of the crown. And I was working with the um, MTA, you know, the Transit Museum to do this as part of Platform. And so um, I took one of those tours and was able to record it. And like, it's these beautiful things where it has this Guastavino tile in it. And it, like, it was used, it was m this like, kind of range of manufacturing because it was like, it absorbed sound, right? Like it would make it so it was less noisy and it was also fireproof, you know, like really kind of beautiful things that were uh, being played with at that point. But yeah, like using that map as a way to sort of then break it up. And I mean, that's, I've never, that's one of those days where I'm like most tired after done recording. <laughs> like it was <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, but it was amazing, so yeah. Uh, out of curiosity, uh, and thinking about the subway, I'm wondering if we can just spend a quick moment about the uh, air has a neurotransmitter. And if, if David, you wouldn't mind speaking about that, just. Um. Um, 
Yes. I'm, I'm not sure that the connection with the subway. Um, uh, but certainly, the, you know, the, the, the idea of an error as a neurotransmitter comes out of my thinking about biology. Um, the way I was raised in, in my biology education, which was in line with the last more than 100 years of way of thinking about biology, which is the fundamental unit of life is the individual. It's very atomistic. The individual neuron, the individual gene, individual organism, individual species. And that's a powerful way of thinking about the world. It's a foundation of the Darwinian view, which, uh, uh, or as, at least as Darwin conceptualized the evolution. Um, a, an alternative way is to say that, no, no, the individual is just a temporary manifestation of interconnection. Mm -hmm. And interconnection and relationship is the real stuff of life, is the real thing that persists and evolves and changes through time. And we know this in, on our own bodies, right? It's, I'm not just made out of human cells. I'm made out of bacterial cells and fungal cells and hopefully not too many viral particles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the same with trees. We call a tree, you know, that's a sugar maple. Well, in fact, it's a hundred different species all interacting with one another in that entity that we pin with a single name, but the name is a lie because it's a living community, not a single entity. Mm -hmm. For whole organisms like a human body, or a salamander, or a fish, what is it that is the stuff of interconnection? It's the senses. And for many creatures, not all, but for many, sound is that connector. And so sound for me is the neurotransmitter, because as I'm speaking now, the ends of my neurons come down from my brain and then, and then come down in my throat and my lungs, and then shoot little vibrations through the air to you, and our brains are actually touching nerve to nerve. And it's, just, it's not a wet synapse full of chemicals that are doing the connection. It's the air. But it is exactly the same thing. Mm. And so one knot of nerves connected into another knot. And so, so when we're hearing sound, we are opening ourselves to the nervous systems of other beings. And so walking through the park in the evening, you're hearing the katydids and the, and the starlings coming to roost you are quite, lit your brain is quite literally wired into the brains of those other creatures, the insect brains and the others, through the air acting as, as a neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. And wiring is not, I mean, wiring is, is an, an analogy, of course, because we're not machines. We're not made from wires. And so I use that, that, that term with, with some caution there. We're, we're living beings that, that transcend the, the, the wiring, if, yeah. if you like. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. I, I definitely feel that way in the subway also, though. <laughs> okay, so we have one more set of clips for you all. Uh, so this is one of my last questions for you uh, about aesthetics and the future of sound. Right. So how do you imagine the sonic landscape of the future and our awareness of it? say perhaps in the future, if we were able to invent ways of fixing climate change, like a machine that could clean the ocean or a firefighting water airplane, presumably these inventions would have sounds, probably loud ones. I'm wondering if we can talk about aesthetic preferences in sound and perhaps what they might mean for the future. So why don't we listen to David's clip So what we're hearing here is, is the convergence of multiple species aesthetics. So the crackly sound there, a snapping shrimp, hundreds of little shrimp all cracking their claws together. And this is the, the dominant sound in most warm waters uh, world around, that they're communicating with each other, but they're also killing their prey. The, those little snapping sounds are so loud that they actually blast their prey to death uh, at close range. I mean, you've got to be within a millimeter for it to really hurt. But. Uh, and then the little bleating sounds with toadfish and the knocking sounds with the sounds of silver perch. 
So some strange below water soundscape. This is from a salt marsh off the coast of Georgia, St. Catharines Island here in the US. Uh, what's in incredible to me, is it's such a weird soundscape and, and of course the creatures are making and perceiving sounds through with, different, with organs that are different from our human organs and yet there is a unity underneath all of this because the perception of sound is happening through little ciliary hairs in our inner ears that carry ocean water within them. So we hear as aquatic creatures always in our, in our inner ears. We carry the ocean as tiny little drops in the cochlea in our, in our ears. How are the shrimp hearing and the fish they're hearing using the same kind of hairs in different arrangements? And the vertebrate creatures, the, the, the fish there, are making these pulsating sounds that are controlled by a little part of the nervous system from the back of the hindbrain that is the same part of the nervous system that governs music and speech in humans. So we hear this ancient unity underneath all this diversity of aesthetic experience. So I, I, one hope for the future is that we can expand the human aesthetic to, enc to encompass the more than human world. Some of it, of course, we can't perceive without the help of technology. Our hearing range is, is narrow, and for me, getting narrower by the year. Uh, so technologies can help expand the imagination and then, of course, expand empathy. Um, but also, even if we cannot be in direct physical relationship with these beings, to realize that this sensory world that we're, we're, we're sharing with needs to, be, needs to be shared in a just way. Mm -hmm. And of course, the second part of that recording is an outboard motor, uh, a very small outboard engine starting up and, and taking off and drowning out all the sound there, a reminder that if there is an acoustic hell on this world right now, it's in the oceans. Mm -hmm. We are pumping so much sound through seismic exploration and through shipping and through sonar. We're, we're driving some of the most intelligent creatures and emotionally intelligent creatures as well, the marine mammals, to distraction, to craziness through the amount of sound that we're pumping in the oceans and literally killing other creatures with the, with the intensity of the sound pressure. And yet, we hear none of it because the, the surface of the water is an amazing sound reflector. It, the sound comes up and goes back down. You can be standing on the ocean shore with seismic exploration for oil going offshore and you will not hear it. Every single creature within hundreds of miles, sometimes thousands of miles, will hear those air guns going off every 10 seconds for months on end. And that's what puts gas in, in our tanks and, and fuels uh, anything with natural gas or or oil. So that's the other part of the aesthetic is, is opening ourselves to the brokenness mm. of the world as a way of, of grounding our senses in, in the consequences of our actions mm -hmm. so that we can then make mature decisions about right action moving forward. I think environmental ethics is, is a lab science, if you like. It's an embodied process. The process of ethical and moral discernment is not a dis should not be dissociated from bodily experience. So that little sound clip to me captures both the wonder of the diversity of sound and the unity that ties all living beings together and the, 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 some of the harm that we humans are doing that we could stop. The great thing about sound pollution is you turn it off, it's gone. Unlike chemical pollution, CO2 and so on that will last for, for, for many years into the future, sound pollution it's not an easy fix, but once the sound source is off, uh, the, the, pr the problem goes away. Yeah, I wonder, you know, you talk about listening has a form of solidarity. Um, I really respond to that phrase. Is there any, you know, thinking about what you just said, can you explain what listening as solidarity means? Uh, it, f for me personally, listening, ha it opens me to the unspeakable beauty of the world that, you know, as a writer I struggle and repeatedly fail to put into words, and the utter brokenness of things. Not just in how we sometimes treat the rest of the world, but just the brokenness inherent in any patch of the world. I mean, every creature in the forest, in the ocean, lives within embodied subjective experience and suffers and dies, and so the weight of pain in any, any part of the world is just crushing if you could open yourself to it. And so both of those things are, uh, become very true, the incredible beauty and the utter brokenness of the world. And I think an, a, a degree of openness to that is necessary not just for solidarity, but then out of solidarity, action. Mm -hmm. and, and the action depends on who we are. Mm -hmm. 
And listening also helps us understand who we are. Like what, so, so yeah, I'm feeling the beauty and the brokenness of the world, all very poetic and all the rest. What do I do about it? Self-knowledge is required to, because you can't do everything. You need to know your place within the human community to know how to step forward. And so listening, yes, it's about listening outward, but it's also about realizing what our own responses are and what our own uh, potential is to engage with the world to produce uh, right action. Thank you. Okay. Let's hear a clip from Paula. So it's part of uh, uh, one, uh, one thing five times. Um, and um, that is, I mean, it's such a beautiful reflection on like that we've been having on sound. And this one has just really felt like kind of a small meditation and just trying to be really like kind of quiet in a way. And so um, like I really am 
interested too in the ways that sound allow us comfort and the way that we seek comfort with each other and, and in one another through sound too. And in this case, this was uh, written at the Log Haven Artist Residency. Um, and that was kind of the first time I'd been with other artists in a sort of like kind of collective environment um, since, since the shutdown. And so everyone was kind of on edge. And then we were taken down to this beautiful cove down there. And I was like, just like, it just, I knew I wanted to spend as much time in there as I could. Um, and so I just kept going there. And then I was working with the staff and they showed me their paths and stuff like that, uh, that they take there. And so I just played the same thing five times in one day and then recorded each of those five things. And then it was really about like not having a definitive performance of anything, but more kind of developing a practice um, that really just kind of we dip into and dip out of. And that was something that, yeah, just was really trying to think of, of a very, very simple thing. And then just using and the repetition as a way of kind of grounding in place. Yeah, you talk about the agency of the listener to bring attention into an emotional space. I wonder if if you could exp expand on that. Um, you, I mean, you talked about that with some other pieces of yours, but I think this piece especially, and, and as we close, I wonder if you could offer some wisdom about that. Um, not sure about wisdom, but... <laughs> <laughs> like, um, but I am interested in those moments where we open things up in terms of like some of the power that sound allows us in terms of being with each other um, and um, like being here together now in this space and things like that too. We have this like profound gift to be able to share ideas and talk with each other. Um, and you know, it's not like, like air is neurotransmitter and it's, it's, but it's also like all these things that we feel and we touch and like, you know, it's just, I've never stopped being amazed at like the way that sound works differently than I anticipate. So I like very much that finding rituals that allow us that surprise and allow us to keep the openness in terms of how things may work. Okay, thank you. There, there are a lot more things to say. I'm sure we could talk for hours, um, but I wanted to ask you both, uh, did you have any questions for each other or anything, any, anything at all you wanna say? that you might not have gotten to speak about? I, I mean, my question is, w when, you're in, when you're working with students, what advice do you give students who, and, and maybe this depends on the particular student, but about how to move further on that path of deeper listening? I know that's a, a big question, but it, uh, the s particular touchstones that you come back to again and again in your teaching practice that seem to have, to have been helpful? Um, great question. Um, a lot of it ends up being to simplify, simplify, simplify. Because um, the question of like, part of in terms of interacting with each other or with space or things like that is then to be like, okay, what is what is being off like offered by being in this together? Um, and so like, if you're writing for something for um, like an idiosyncratic instrument, like something that's unusual, because then it's sort of like, what does it like? You know, and even though, but that can expand so many ways. Like, what does the piece like? What does, you know, and just sort of kind of trying to, trying to keep that um, as a way of, of opening it up a little bit. Um, sometimes I think the simplest things are the hardest to like right. get at. I mean, I'm just like really, I, I have pointed a number of my students actually towards your work too. So oh. <laughs> it's like, because <laughs> I, find that the idea of listening in the way of like um, thinking of instruments is uh, really, really relevant to the way that we think about um, how we make sound together in these ways. So. All right. Well, I think we have a, a few moments here, right? Are we out of time? We are out of time. We do not have a few moments here. So if you have some questions for Paula and David, please find them during the reception and ask away. But for now, thank you so much for your attention, your presence, your listening skills. We appreciate all of you, and especially David and Paula. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.